This one here is a some hello engine stuff that we're gonna be talking about today. And a little bit of other kind of stuff, a little bit of electrical stuff. And so everybody pay attention because this is this is a pretty good uh, story here. And uh, you know, whenever you uh, that's what I was telling you talking about yesterday, if you find yourself just trying to wing it and fell out of this plow into this and figure it out, uh, you, you get in trouble. And we uh, we mentioned that yesterday. And that's kind of right here. And then Look, don't look at the shop, man. Don't be one of those people. I always, sometimes whenever I go in here and I look through it and I'll see some stuff, some steps that I don't really think I need to take, I evaluate it to determine do I really need to do this? Uh, you know, and like I, just about every one of the things is take, the, take negative battery curve off. That's not really a big deal there, but sometimes it'll tell you to take stuff off that you don't need to take off, uh, but you may find out if you work around that. Other times, you may be like you're working with your Jeep there. You may go into somewhere like all that, and it may not have everything you need. They may have left out steps and stuff like that, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, a lot of it. So here we got a 2005 Sport Sportage. Now this one here uh, wobbles into the air conditioner territory. And so, uh, well, not really. Uh, the next one wobbles into the air conditioner. This, this Kia is, a, is an engine thing. And this is the one where you're actually supposed to pull the uh, cradle Take everything loose from the engine, pull the cradle, drop the transmission of the cradle all in one piece. You may have seen some like that before. Nissan Altimas are like that and some others. Uh, but he figured, well, I can see all the bolts and everything you hold the engine in there. So he unbolted the engine from the transmission and he started to transaxle. And he started trying to get it out of there and then he realized he couldn't get the transaxle. And he couldn't get the engine out because the transaxle was preventing, wouldn't let go of the engine. And you move it over this way a little bit and it hits the frame and it was just... He had it loose down to run over, he couldn't get it out. So he got himself in a pickle like that. Had to kind of halfway put it back together and then go out with it the other way. Uh, yeah, but if he, all he had to do was go to the information system, he would have seen this. If I go and I look and I see this, I'm thinking, well, if they're showing me this cradle, that means all that's supposed to come out together. You know? Now, this is not always the case. Like on a Ford Taurus, uh, I have actually, you know, we've, we've done it both ways. We've actually pulled a four engine on a three liter engine out of a Ford Taurus from the top. But you're supposed to come out the bottom with it. You know, this, uh, this is the first picture in the engine removal procedure, though, right there, so you should have been able to figure that out. And sometimes follow the shop manual is a bad idea because some of the information in there is stuck on stupid. And they'll give you bad information. Now, I will tell you that Kia and Hyundai will tell you stuff in their shop manual literature that's not true. And I run into that a time or two, and this is one of those cases right there. Uh, the owner of this thing, you notice the compressor noise was really, really bad. He couldn't stand operating the AC unless it was really cold. In other words, it was making a lot of noise, just really horrible. You turn it on instantly, you hear a lot of roar under the hood. Despite the fact that it was still working pretty good, so he had to have that. So we put a couple of people working on that one. We were going to put the dryer on it. We were going to put the expansion valve, and then we were going to put the compressor on it. Uh, got all that in a kit. Incidentally, if you buy all that stuff in a kit, you save a heck of a lot of money. If you buy it all in a, you know, like that. So, uh, but knowing that the Asians like to stuff the expansion valve inside the evaporator case, and we've seen that before where the expansion valve be inside the evaporator case, you usually don't see a block type thing, you see one of them other kinds. But I said, well, they do, they do that. These, these Asian cars, Toyotas and stuff, they'll put it, you know, where you gotta pull the dash out and get the expansion valve and all that. On the Volkswagen Rabbits, you can just lay it there in the floorboard, and you can see it up in there and work on it. And all that. Uh, I wasn't surprised to read the evaporator case needed to come out and to replace this thermal expansion valve. So we basically started going in there to do that. And then I happened to walk by and I said, you know, usually these are out here under the hood. And then when I looked out under the hood, I saw this right here. That's not a good focused picture, but that's what I saw. My camera focused on this instead of that. But that is where the expansion valve was not there. The book told us you had to pull the dash. The book told us it was in here. But if you just looked at the truck, you'd see it out here. So actually a bunch of work got done that didn't need to be done on that one. And so if you see a block type expansion valve, think to look under the hood because like yours was. The one when you're working on, it's under the hood. You know, that's what you took loose from back there. That's the expansion valve. All right, so the compressor didn't fit right either. They sent this compressor here. You notice how these are a little smaller on the back end? And that compressor there is just as big as all the way down. Well, there was a little curve in the suction line that required that little dimple to be there before it would hook up. And whenever we got the new compressor, uh, it wouldn't fit. So we got another uh, re well, rebuilt compressor. We got another rebuilt compressor that had that little dimple in it like this one here did. See how that's a little smaller there? 
and it worked just fine. That compressor was perfectly right in every way except for the way that that was built. So that was a aggravating little thing. All right. So I've talked a little bit about this one before, but I'm going to show you some pictures and talk about it a little more. First time we saw this, it was running bad. And she, she's a sweetheart of a girl. She wasn't going to give anybody a hard time. So she went to this shop in a nearby town over here and had the car look at it. So it ran it really bad at Iowa. And they put spark plugs in it and charged her $500. That's what she told me. I don't know, you know. And I said, what do you mean? Are you sure that's all they did? She said, well, that's all that was on the bill. You know, spark plugs, 500 bucks. Fell around like a three-legged dog. She drove away. She didn't want to fight with them. So she asked why the bill was so high, the reply was half of it was labor. This was a four cylinder and the plugs were right at the top, okay? This is a true story, I'm not making this up. All right, so uh, there was this, this same shop over there one time, this lady went over in her Nissan Altima and said her air conditioner wasn't working and they shined a flashlight down in there and picked a couple of fuses and said, we don't know what's wrong, but it'll probably be $500. Or no, $1,000 or something like that. They wanted to say, well, whatever it was, it was $1,000, $500, whatever it was, it's gonna be a lot of money. Uh, what we found though, the guy that I had put working on it, he found a vacuum hose that was leaking. Split vacuum hose. And when he fixed the split vacuum hose, it ran real smooth. I mean, all of that island problem went away. But when we test drove the car, the right front wheel bearing was as bad as I've ever heard. It sounded like you had a chainsaw running in the right front floorboard. It was awful. It was terrible. And so uh, we had what says this. And think about this. If that place had driven the car after they supposedly did this $500 worth of repairs, wouldn't they have heard this bearing and tried to sell it to her? You know what I mean? All right, think about that. All right, so what we did was we sold her a bearing. She's good on that. Then she's driving along down the road and hits this piece of rebar. See, I talked about this a little bit the other day. See that hole in the oil pan? And that piece of rebar, that aluminum oil pan is cast aluminum, and if something hit it, don't ever put a floor jack under a cast aluminum oil pan to jack the car up or you will bust the oil pan you'll have to put an oil pan on it. Don't ever do that. If for some reason you have to put a jack under that engine to raise it up a little or something, put a big fine 2 by 4 or something on top of the jack so it's got a, so that the claws on that jack aren't trying to crack through the, you know, the pan. But you know, put a big old, you know, 2 by 6 or something on it. And you can put a little bit of pressure on it. Don't put a whole lot of pressure on aluminum oil pan though. And some oil pans on some cars, hadn't seen one in a long time, it's plastic. Right. It's been years since seen one of them. All right, he had, uh, their, her boyfriend told her it was only a stick that she ran over, but she was just getting rid of all the oil real fast coming out that hole right there. And it, she just figured, well, I didn't really drive it very far, you know. And so what we did when we uh, pulled it out there, we burned out a rod. See, the, see that rod doesn't turn that gray color? It got really, really hot, wiped out those bearings, destroyed the crankshaft. This is the engine that y'all put the timing chain back on. Uh, Same engine. Uh, and all that. And so, so here we go. This is when things got stupid. The parts stores, pretty good, you know, that we use up here. Um, they bring power through LKQ. I used to deal directly with the local LKQ people down in Florida, but they moved and I couldn't get them anymore and all that kind of stuff. So I had the price, to, a parts store price me out a replacement engine and they gave me go ahead. All right. So that was just fine, right? All right. So. The guy's got the old engine out of the cobalt, set it on a tire, and we're over there in that area where y'all are working on that Suburban right there. All right, they disconnected from subframe, the transaxle, and they had to pull it out like we were supposed to. And that's where the stuck on stupid syndrome kicked in at the parts store. i tell you what happened at the parts store. Okay, two weeks went by, I kept asking him, where's my engine, where's my engine? You know, I don't be here any day, any day, I'll be here any day. Well, what he found out was when he left one day, another truck came in, well, the engine came, and then another truck came, and they unloaded a bunch of pallets of stuff and shoved the engine up against the wall, and it was hiding behind a bunch of pallets, and he didn't know it was there. And it was there for like 10 days, you know. And so when uh, the rep came by, I said, where's my engine? Can you find out about my engine? So he went over there, and somebody said, oh, there is an engine back there. We don't know who that was for. That must be the one he's talking about. <laughs> this was 10 days later. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Okay, so that was one of them things. So now we got stupid, all right? We pull, the, we get a new engine in there, what we want to do is we want to break open, the, you know, see if it's got sludge in it. If you get a used engine that's loaded with sludge, you're going to need to do what you can to do. If it's loaded with sludge bad enough, you need to request another engine. If it's just mal, 
loaded with sludge because what happens is when that sludge breaks loose, when the engine is good warm, it goes down in the oil can and it picks up on the oil screen and it starves it for oil and locks the engine up. I've seen that happen. So we kind of want to look down in the valve cover. You know, usually if you look down in, you know, if you take the valve cover off, you can look at it and tell if it's going to be sludged up everywhere else too. You know, if it's got a lot of sludge up here, you know it's got a lot down the pan. This one here looked pretty good in that regard, but the uh, the oil, the seal, the rear main seal was leaking. It's always a good idea to put a rear main seal on it when you're, if it's leaking. If it ain't leaking, don't worry about it, but this one here was leaking. So we popped the rear main seal out of there, uh, had them send us another one. Or no, what happened was, how'd that work? We had them send us another one and the guys had pulled the rear main seal out when they found out it was leaking. And so the seal came in and then my guys come over here and so they're holding me two seals up here that look totally different. And they said, this doesn't look like the rear main seal. And it turned out after we confused the crud out of the parts man, he was scratching his head trying to figure out what went wrong. Uh, the seal they picked up to compare it to came out of a 91 F-150 that we had just changed the seal out the previous week. So they were, com we got stupid. We were comparing <laughs> and the parts guy killing himself trying to find something that would fit. And then I happened to look at that seal they handed me really close and it said forward on it. I said, what? This is not the seal that came out of that engine. You know, of course, if you're just standing there holding two seals, you don't know. You know? <laughs> anyway, that's one of these kind of things. But anyway, we kind of got it back together and put the other shop's $250 set of spark plugs in there. It must have been some fine spark plugs, right? And, and we filled it up with oil and coolant and watched the engine cool and temperature sensor with the scan tool while it closed in the fan cycle. Whenever you're putting one of these back together, make sure you use your bleeder screws. You've talked about that in some of your worksheets. Make sure the fan kicks on and off four times. If the fan kicks on and stays on, it means something's wrong. And I'm not talking about when your AC's on. But if the, if the coolant fan, radiator coolant fan kicks on and stays on, and it keeps getting hotter and hotter and hotter, there's something wrong you need to fix. But if it kicks on and off, and on and off, if it's cycling back and forth between two acceptable temperatures, then you're pretty well solid. Now, I've often said this, you know, pour in the water in the motors, and I like filling up a bucket with anything. You basically got to make sure the air is all burped out, your bleeders have been used and all that. I have seen them though that said they had bleeders when they didn't. In other words, the book will tell you there's another thing where the book was wrong. And it may have been this car. But anyway, we looked and looked and looked for the bleeders they said were there and there were no bleeders there. So uh, I don't know if there's that car, I can't remember the other one. All right, now here's the Mazda, the Cobalt, and the Sedona we were working on at the same time. This was the air conditioner job, this was the engine job. And this was a Mazda that was very interesting. This is an electrical thing, so you two pay attention to that. I talked to you about it a little bit the other day. All right, this one kept burning up starters. The guy that owned the car had replaced the starter, and it didn't work very long before it burned that starter up, but it was a used starter he got from the salvage yard anyway. Okay, so we got it in here to do some other work on it, and we noticed that the starter was sounding really horrible, and so, we put another starter on it from the park store. And that starter didn't last very long either. I'm talking about while we still were working on it in the shop, it burned that starter up. Okay, so what's going to burn my starter up? Bad connections. Hmm? Bad connections or shorts. Well, possibly, because if you got low voltage going to a starter, it'll destroy it. Way but it's kind of acting like a fire. Huh? Way too much current. Why would you have too much current? I mean, a lot of current's good, ain't it? When my dad uh, and I took that old 58 Volkswagen Bug, and it had a, a six volt system on it. Uh, we put a 12 volt a generator on it and a 12 volt battery, and it would just start the crud out of that thing. It'd spin that thing so fast, it never caused any problem. So if you got a lot of current, even if you got a six volt starter and you spin it with 12 volts, it just spins it a heck of a lot faster, you know. But this is a strange problem that makes sense after I figured out what was wrong with it, but I've never seen one of these do this before. And I actually talked about it in one of my motor articles about starter stuff. Uh, and you, you may not ever see this, but it's something you definitely need to pay attention to. Now, whenever the starter energizes, whenever. I'm turning the key and I'm putting voltage down to that solenoid and that solenoid energizes with its winding and it slaps a copper washer against the two posts, the one coming from the battery and the one going into the starter. That's a contactor, basically what that is. It's like you have on some of your air conditioners. You have to slap them things together good and hard or they're going to weld and all that. 
And on this particular one here, I was checking because we had already burned up these other starters and I could tell they had fried them and they were sounding strange, you know what I mean? There was nothing wrong with the way the starter was mounted. There was nothing wrong with the battery connection. We checked voltage drop on from the battery to the starter and to, from the ground to the starter. There's nothing wrong with the voltage drop there. But this right here is the wiring for this thing. Ignition switch. This right here is your cut relay so that it'll, if that relay is open, it's not going to start and that's going to be like for your any theft and all that, you see. All right. Transaxle range switch right there. All right. And then it, uh, let's, let's get rid of all the wiring we don't need. Now we can look at it a little simpler, right? Okay. So we got this coming through here. The ignition switch goes through that over here and it goes through this winding the ground, right? Now here's your battery. Now that little thing there slaps together and it feeds power to the motor. But this is the one that triggers it, right? So, you measure voltage drop between the little, the little wire that triggers the solenoid and the battery, positive battery terminal, with the starter in a spinning position. You had about three, maybe even four, I don't remember exactly, volts of drop. So you were, this little thing right here was energizing it. What was it doing to what was supposed to be a contactor it was pulling the thing together real slow. And it was having time to scorch it, weld it, and create. So you basically started out with a voltage drop here, and then you wound up with a voltage drop in here where you couldn't even measure it. And the, the fact that you had low voltage going to the starter after this got scorched a few times because it wasn't slapping together good and hard, that kept burning the starter up because it was like a bad connection somewhere else. So if you got a really weak battery, a bad connection, dropping a lot of voltage, you'll cook a starter, and that's what was cooking this one. All right, here's the Buick Rendezvous. Uh, I was talking about this a little bit the other day. Both of them replaced the fuel pump on them. There's your new relay in that box back there. All right, and the way this thing is fixed up, fuel, now be careful that vehicles with fuel pump driver modules won't show the ground in the relay socket. So we want to check this right here for a ground. Ground coming through the pump to that on pin F12. Pay attention to pin F12. Connector C3, pin F12. That's how you vector into exactly the pin you need to be looking at. All right. They show no ground path at the relay terminal. Okay, who wants to watch me pull the relay out and put a test light in there? You want to see that happen? All right. I pull the relay out, put a test light here. I should be reading the ground all the way through here. I got nothing. This caused them to replace the relay and two fuel pumps. See, the fuel pump was just fine, but it wasn't getting anything. All right, and so what we wound up doing here, we went in there. Now, can you read that right there? What does that say? What's that word? Now, see this? F12. See that? And this is connector C3. Now, I actually got that thing over. I showed it to you last week. But right here is your pin now, F12. And see how it burned? That was where the power was supposed to be going to the fuel pump. And somebody had actually replaced that terminal, but we still had trouble in here because that had been really hot too. See how this oxidized and all that? All right, so we'll pay attention to that. Now, we actually got a used fuse panel for a hundred bucks from a salvage yard and fixed that. One. And uh, they were really happy about that. That actually belonged to one of my colleagues that works on the other campus. All right, now we got a Dodge Caravan. All she told me was that her caravan was janking. You ever heard somebody use that word? Janking. What does that mean? Jerk and yank. Jerk and yank. It's like a cross between jerk and yank. <laughs> All that. So I recognize that as a hybrid word that's between jerk and yank, right? All right. So sent one of my more seasoned guys, a guy that kind of knew, you know, pretty good bit. He came back and said it was a surge, but it only did a couple of times, just briefly. All right, the code we pulled was for an inactive or slow oxygen sensor, which on the Chrysler can happen anywhere within the range. See, like, oxygen sensor is supposed to switch like that. And on those Chryslers, if it hangs out just above a half a volt, just about every other vehicle I've seen that have this kind of oxygen sensor, that, you know, with the zirconia, it will fail down here, and it'll go into open loop. Well, what Chrysler does, it would get confused, and I've seen this on a bunch of Chrysler vehicles, about a six-tenths of a volt. And then the fuel trims would get this ugly sawtooth pattern. It would be, it would, it would try to control the fuel and then drop into open loop. And try to control the fuel and drop into open loop. And what you would feel is, I mean, horrible going down the road because of a dead gum oxygen sensor. I had a, it was a Dodge truck I looked at one time and plumb quit running because of that. 
And uh, I mean, it was just driving the president of college crazy because it was his truck. All right, and so this one right here, the second test drive of the Nemesis tool showed it was right above the half a volt line. You know, and there's your fuel trims responding to the oxygen sensor switches. But when it was failing, it was failing right above that half a volt line. And you know, that's a lot of times the, the other ones will, you know, they'll flatline and come back. Oxygen sensors aren't as bad to fail now as they used to be. They're a lot more dependable though. Uh, and along with those repeated fuel trim corrections, make the engine button absurd. So we had verified our concern and isolated the problem. Right? We knew what we were looking at. We determined that it was indeed looked at the scan tool, saw it happening. We had probable cause, not only based on what our scan tool was showing us in the PID window, but the experience, as I remembered, with similar platforms. Solid data, prior experience, gathered our data scientifically, and we see no other concerns related otherwise. We put an O2 sensor on it, $80 or something, or whatever. All right, now, she didn't have a lot of money. So what happened was, we only went up, we went twice. What we thought would be the final test drive, my guys came back and said the battery light's flashing and it quit on us out here in the parking lot. Uh-oh. Jerking and surging really bad. Wait a minute, was this what she was talking about before? Or was it two problems that felt like the same thing? Because we actually never duplicated this until we were to replace the oxygen sensor and fix the other problem. They said it ran real good until the battery light came on. All right, so it was the DOA. 4 o'clock p.m. She was expecting to come back that Thursday night, get off the bus and drive away, and it wasn't going to happen. The alternator issue. So what we did was we got brushes and slip here. We got a better set of brushes out of an old alternator we had on hand. It was the same kind of alternator. And see how that's wore out? Now, we'll tell you that when Visteon rebuilds an alternator, they make sure that this slip ring is exactly the right diameter. A lot of the alternator rebuilders won't do that. But they did, Visteon does a really good job on that. I actually talked to some of their engineers one time. Um, but anyway, I told her she needed an alternator soon, but it was the best we could do, you know. So she basically was able to drive away. So I had a couple, you see that brush right there, how it's wore out? And how it was barely touching that, and it was making all that arcing as it was doing its last wearing out, and it watered that in. All right. Question one, why didn't she mention the battery light and or a dead battery problem if this was the same problem? She didn't say nothing about a dead battery, when we experienced that. She had written on the first test drive and verified the surge, which I basically had taken her on the first test drive. Uh, maybe she hadn't seen a battery light. Maybe it was a coincidental failure. Maybe it was something that happened, just happened to happen at the same time. I don't know how many times I've seen that. Let me tell you some stories about that. Uh, was it truly an information disconnect or a circumstantial landmine? Incidentally, when the customer comes back and they've got the idea that something you did is causing another problem they're having, it's best to give them the benefit of the doubt until you find out it's not your doing, because sometimes it is. You know, I've had some experiences like that. Uh, what do you do when you spent most of what somebody had in their checking account and you were sure it was a legitimate fix? I mean, you know what I'm saying? And then they have another more expensive problem that rears its head before the car leaves the shop. That kind of makes you, you know, it's a bad situation. All right. Now, even when a customer doesn't communicate well, whatever the reason, we should try to. Now, I will tell you this. I've had uh, two people that I've seen, they, they came in here and I was talking to, and I would very concisely and carefully explain something to them, you know, before we ever started the work or whatever. And they'd be sitting there looking at me, nodding their head. And I'm thinking, okay, they get what I'm saying. And then as soon as I got through talking, they would ask me the same questions that I had just answered, like they didn't hear a doggone thing I said. You know, a couple of different guys, I saw that. That one guy out there that I had in here years ago, I would say, we're going to put this battery on this hand truck, and we don't want to hook the jumper cable clips to this metal bar, okay, because it's going to short out if you do. He's nodding his head. And then as soon as I backed up, he grabbed him, hooked him to the bar, and made a you know, trying to weld the thing together. What did you do that for? I just told you not to do that, you know? Oh, oh, yeah, okay. But I mean, sometimes you don't know how much they're hearing, or if they're trying to, uh, a lot of times it's good to write it down, too. Or if they're trying to think about what they're going to ask next and not really listen to what you're saying. You know what multitasking is? That's doing two or more things poorly, right? <laughs> so you need to focus on what you're doing, right? All right, so they may not know the right words. My pulleys don't look right, or something like that. You know, they'll say they'll say stuff that to them makes sense, but to you, it's like what? 
you know, like something like a, a surge, you know, or Jenkin, you know, this, these kind of words like that, you know, you don't really know. So sometimes even when we try to communicate well, they don't hear everything we're trying to tell them. Don't be a jerk. One of the, one of the things that I've seen too many people is when they start to get a little bit of measure of success in the field, they'll feel like they're, they have a license to be a jerk to people they feel like they don't know as much as they do and to customers because they feel like they're so good that they can just treat anybody any way they want to. You don't want to be one of those people either. And, I, and Bear Bryant said, it don't cost nothing to be nice. Do you agree with that? So it's a whole lot better to be nice to folks, you know, than it is to do that. All right. Tell me something you learned. It doesn't cost nothing to be nice. <laughs> <laughs> the last thing I said. He reminds me of my niece. Okay. What about you? You, you picked up something. I know. Yeah. yeah. I can name a couple of things. Yeah. Huh? So I can name a couple of things. Yeah. What about it? Yeah, you can do that with a lot of components. You learn anything, Mr. Hart? A couple. A couple of things. That, that's the way you dodge without not having to say what you learned. You just say, yeah, I learned something because I think it's wrong. What about you? Yes. Yep. Electrical stuff, what we're talking about. Voltage drop's important, even in places you wouldn't think about checking for it. You know what I mean? That's right. And if it keeps burning the same starter up, here's the other thing. If the same component keeps failing, just replacing the component again is not the way to go. You need to find out why it's failing. You know, we were goofy enough to think, well, that first starter was crappy it came from the parts house, you know, occasionally you'll have that. That wasn't the problem this time. What about you, Mr. Well, jerking and yanking. Huh? Jerking and yanking. Jerking and yanking is janking. You, that's not the last time you've heard that. I'm about the voltage drop. About the washer stuff? You mean on what now? The voltage drop. Oh, the voltage drop, yeah. Yeah, that's a good thing. All right. There you go. You know.